my heart is beating really fast because I'm very excited about everything I just heard from our previous speaker. In the Asia Pacific region who are trying to address the impacts of U.S. militarism and U.S. military buildup. U.S. bases, U.S. Uh, bombing, U.S. Um, budget priorities, uh, and so on. And we've been part of that as people who are both based in the United States. Uh, as you may be able to tell, I'm originally from here, um, but for a long time I've lived in the States, and so, you know, thinking about what's our responsibility wherever we are located for the situations that we're part of perpetuating, you know, whether it's as taxpayers or uh, voters uh, or not, uh, and so on. So that's kind of the context to the work we've been doing. I'm really aware, as someone from the UK, that there was not much emphasis here when I was growing up. So that long colonial history is part of the background to the work we've been doing. Okay, so um, I am uh, African-American and Japanese woman living in the US uh, and have had to really think about my own social location uh, and my positionality in relation to this topic that uh, we're going to be speaking about. And specifically, before um, I went to South Korea in 1994 as a Fulbright researcher, I thought about race, class, gender, sexuality. Like They all kind of ran together. But what I did not think about was the category of nation. And specifically, what it meant uh, to be connected to two imperial nations, Japan uh, and the U.S. And I didn't realize that uh, until I went to Korea, and uh, because I speak Japanese, I w was able to speak with uh, older Korean people who had lived under Japanese occupation, colonization, and um, uh, because I had the U.S. passport, I could go to places, namely near the demilitarized zone where uh, local Korean people could not go. I could go um, on tours around there. And, you know, standing in the middle of Seoul, I realized that, oh, it didn't matter that, you know, I'm, quote, marginalized woman of color in the U.S. In certain contexts, it's critical that I, I came to understand the, how the category of nation matters, that I'm connected to these two imperial uh, powers. Uh, and those of us in dominant positions, we can't see the ways in which our dominance operates, right? We can see our marginalization, but it doesn't go the other way. And so um, that was a very important awakening, and as the uh, saying goes, the rest is history. Gwen and I um, uh, started then working on um, the what became the International Women's Network Against Militarism when we began to connect the dots between Korea, Philippines, Okinawa, Japan, and then and the U.S., and eventually Puerto Rico, Hawaii, and Guam. Maki, could you turn the, go to the next one? Yeah. And so, oops, just, Is this this one? just the one, oh, sorry. yeah, just, sorry, quick, oops, before, oops, oops. In other words, we, we really um, need, needed to include the category of nation in what people now talk about as intersectionality, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. That's one. Yeah. Nation. Okay. Yeah. nation. Uh, and I think it applies for many people in this room as well. So I'll claim that for myself, right? Being raised in this country, of course, we are raised with a certain history. It's a rather triumphalist history, uh, <coughs> British history, um, imperialism, and so on. It's a very partial history. And I've been humbled, and I would say shamed, uh, in traveling to other parts of the world where people can tell me much more about what British colonial administrators did than I ever learned here in school. I expect to be learning about that for the rest of my life because there are huge gaps in what we learn here as people from a dominant uh, group in terms of nation. So even though my people in class terms were not the people who were colonial administrators, I realized that 
you know, the whole story that this country has told about itself for a very long time, and people here who are my generation probably are very familiar with this too. We were all brought up under some similar mythologies, um, you know, about Great Britain, uh, that uh, we really have to be both mindful of and also, I think, aware of the ways in which we'll never really get it fully. So part of our job is to be very good listeners and to put ourselves deliberately, mindfully, in situations where we can hear the truth from other people. And we heard some of that going on this morning. Yeah. So what we want to do this afternoon is kind of, our, our, our conversation, as it were, is more methodological. Sort of how do we engage tra as transnational feminists in various struggles, and how do we connect um, local struggles with global struggles. And that's kind of the crux of it. We want to make three points. We want to talk about how our work has helped us theorize from the ground up. Uh, we both have doctorates. We, we know the other theories. But we found that some of the most, um, the theories that best explain what's happening are actually rooted in, in uh, activist um, understandings and in commu affected communities. The second point we're going to be talking about is recognizing the multifaceted inequalities that are both uh, structural and interpersonal. And then uh, the third thing we'll be talking about is how um, committing to uh, particular feminist relational practices has been an essential part of our work over the last 25 years. That's how long we've been doing this. I know. Okay. Oh, to recognize, and I have to recognize a few people in the audience that I have known for even longer, uh, both Rebecca and Alice, uh, and we met through the Greenham Network years ago. Other people here may also have been part of that network. So that, yeah, this is long-term, long-haul work. Um, you know, with, with any luck, we'll be doing it for the rest of our lives. Uh, as many of you in the room have already been doing. What do, I want, what do you want me to talk about here? Okay. Talk about that, because you probably are clear what you want to say. <laughs> I've been telling you. <laughs> we go on like this quite a lot. So, um, you say what you want to say. Yes, yeah, so um, what we've learned from working with the network this is one important explanation that uh, we came to understand. The other thing uh, we came to understand is really knowing the difference between knowing something and understanding something. Right? They're not the same thing. Knowing is facts. You know, you can get those all over uh, the internet, anywhere. Understanding means that what we know, we, we've incorporated into our consciousness, into our ways of being in the world, that it becomes a kind of a moral imperative of, of um, uh, how, to, how to organize together, how to relate to people. So I'd like you all to think about when you know something and when you deeply understand something. Um, what we came to understand are that militarism and militarization, and people have already spoken about this this morning, are really uh, global, they're two sides of the same coin, and they are inextricably linked to uh, global capitalism. That's it's clear. Um, and uh, we also learned that we can't talk about militarism and militarization without talking about colonialism, neocolonialism, and imperialism, because all of those obviously are bound up together. And when we asked those questions, uh, we came to another question about when and what are post-colonial. Like, what does that actually mean? When is colonialism over? And when is a place decolonized? Right. And earlier speakers spoke about that a little bit. So getting to now, the thinking more about multifaceted inequalities. Um, we are working with people from various countries in Asia and the Pacific, as I mentioned earlier. Margot listed the names of those places. And uh, they're all very um, interconnected. 
Japan has been an imperial power in Korea, in the Philippines, in Guam. Uh, the United States, of course, has been an imperial power in the Philippines. Guam is a U.S. territory. The United States annexed Hawaii. Uh, and Korean businesses have um, risen up and are very active now in the Philippines, um, extracting profit and so on. So those are the, some of the kind of big structural inequalities and the situations that we come from. Our money doesn't go so far. The yen is very strong. So the women from Japan and even Okinawa, which is very second class within Japan, you know, have great buying, buying power. So when we talk about working together, getting together across these differences, going to international meetings, some people have much more money than others. Um, the dollar is not so bad. Uh, currency in the Philippines, of course, is really weak in terms of international trading. And so that's one very important structural difference. Another one concerns language. Um, and we have tried to, and we'll come on to talk a little bit more about some of the practices, but I'll just note that now. The differences of language, who speaks English, uh, people who have been college educated, which rules out a huge number of grassroots women activists who have a, uh, you know, great insight into what's happening locally, but don't get the chance to participate in international meetings often because those meetings are invariably held in English. Um, one of the goals here is to try to work internationally within our little network without replicating the same inequalities as exist between our nations. And that's a goal and something that's aspirational. It's ex in extremely difficult to do in practice because those structural inequalities keep reasserting themselves. I mean, they're there, right? Uh, another one concerns visas. Who can get visas to go to international meetings? Uh, the women in our network from the Philippines have great difficulty going to any meeting on U.S. territory. That includes Guam, it includes Puerto Rico, and it includes the continental U.S. Because U.S. immigration policy assumes that they're going to overstay their visas, and so they ask them all kinds of questions. They have to pay a fee to be interviewed at the embassy, and then they ask, do you have children? How old are you? Do you have a job? What's your income? Uh, you know, while the immigration official tries to estimate whether or not they're going to overstay. Uh, that's just one other example. The political stakes in different locations are really different. So, you know, some people are, can go to choose, as we heard earlier, you know, choose to go to prison. Uh, for others, that's absolutely out of the question for a range of reasons. Uh, also, very draconian laws. I mean, all our societies, I think, especially since uh, September 11th, 2001, have become increasingly militarized with more laws that um, make it difficult to, uh, you know, engage in public uh, protest and also to travel to do that is more difficult. Uh, Korea has a national security law that's been on the books for a very long time. So the stakes in different places about being able to be uh, publicly associated with various activist efforts, I think, are really different. And it's really important that we kind of remember all of that when we're trying to work together. Uh, another piece about difference uh, that we, uh, we're thinking about is actually the difference between Margot and I. So we both come from dominant nations in many ways, but clearly we look very different, and that um, how we look is, is really important in how people perceive us and who they perceive as the authoritative one in certain circumstances. <laughs> so, I'm the one who in Asia looks American because many people in Asia assume that Americans are white. They assume they have, maybe have white hair or older or looking like me. I travel on a British passport because I have not given that up, even though I've lived in the States a long time. But I'm thought of as the American one. 
People who are women of color from the States who are part of our network are not invited in the same way to be part of press conferences, to give talks on public forums, because they don't look American slash foreign slash authoritative. And that's how colonialism works, right, in terms of who um, gets to be able to say certain things and who is not listened to. Between us, I would say, well, you saw the dynamic. Margot is saying to me, you say it. And I'm, but she knows exactly what she wants to say. <laughs> and so, you know, between us, the intellectual work we do together, the writing that we do together, it's very shared, I would say. Um, but um, I have to accept and acknowledge and try and dodge sometimes the fact that I'm given more credit for it often than Margot is. At the same time, I'm willing to be deployed as a white person in certain contexts where that seems valuable um, or reasonable, and that's one of the things I think I can do, you know, as an ally. To, but that has to be talked out and to be rather um, intentional, I think. It's not just assuming, oh, everybody's so nice to me, thinking that people are just nice, you know, rather than accepting that I'm being given a particular status because of how I look and therefore, in a way, what people expect of me. So it goes back to how we think about what our responsibilities are. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, <laughs> as a woman of color, I'm the party person. <laughs> So, I mean, both cases, very stereotypical, right? <laughs> stereotypical assumptions. Right, right. Uh, you know, I'm the social relations person. You know, I ask people uh, the people questions. You know, um, Gwen is thought of as being much more uh, aloof or detached. I'm the more emotional one. Uh, and, you know, any kind of theorizing that happens between us, right, it's assumed that Gwen has worked out the theoretical knots. Right, and I'm just <laughs> playing the music. <laughs> um, and you know, I think if we if we don't have the kind of relationships we relationship we have, it would be hard to just let that go. That kind of um, popular perception, right? Um, what's important, though, is in working across these lines of difference, particularly deep ones like nation and race, for example. Right. We have to have a way, and we've had to have a way, we've had to develop a way, we certainly did not have it in the beginning, to, to um, develop a language, develop signals, you know, in meetings when we give, one person gives somebody else the eye to say, okay, you take this one, I'll take this one, knowing when to challenge stereotypes, knowing, you know, when it's like, okay, it's not about us, you know, it's about those racist people out there. Um, but to really, that, that, that takes practice. And I think um, in, whether it's here in Britain or um, in, in the U.S. and other places as well, right, these dynamics really do appear, right? Uh, and depending on the context, um, the dynamics, of course, would be very different. But that dynamic of who's considered dominant, who's considered the knowledgeable one, the expert, right? I think these are issues that we have to deal with uh, when we're working transnationally, right? Uh, and it actually, yesterday, when we were, you know, really preparing uh, in more detail this conversation, we worked out one of those knots, right, which is we were able to really articulate this question of who's the party person, the relational person, and who's uh, considered the, the theorist, right? And so that example, to say that it's almost a lifelong process, it's been during the 25 years of our friendship, right, um, that we've had to work these out. So, um, gosh, where to go from that? Um, let's talk a little bit about point three, yeah. move on. So committing to relational practices, this is not just between us, but a pe between other members of the network. Um, let's look at a few slides here, please. 
we can skip that one. This is just the U.S. command. So oh, yeah, we just show that U.S. Okay. command. Okay. <laughs> you all already talked about it, but you can see the picture. Right. Yeah, the U.S. divides the world into five or six military commands. You can see the scope of the Pacific Command, uh, uh, you know, headquartered in Hawaii, and um, Korea, Japan, Philippines, etc., you know, where we're working. And just as a footnote, the, the newest one is called AFRICOM. It's the command uh, over the continent of Africa. And I think those of you from various African countries can tell us more about what's going on there. But it's really an important new formation uh, where many of the countries have agreed to allow U.S. bases to exist, or at least uh, U.S. personnel. Okay. Okay, so moving on. Go ahead. You go ahead. So some of the things about uh, the way we try to work with the network, we see each other in person very rarely because it costs so much to travel. Uh, and of course there are environmental questions increasingly about long distance travel. Uh, but we've set up various international meetings in different locations where women come from those various places and we try and strategize together, share information. And there's been a sort of formula almost about how those meetings go. So they're not conferences uh, where people can just come in and out and do their session and leave. They're more working meetings where people stay together and you know spend time together. And one of the things we do is go on site visits. So the thing there is that local people show us what they most want us to understand. Um, as you see from the slide, this is an art exhibit in South Korea. It uh, is work that has been produced by people who have worked in military prostitution about US ba around U.S. bases, older Korean women. Next one, please. Um, we also have tried to incorporate kind of um, creativity, whether it's um, drawing, painting, music, something or other else. Because what we're trying to do is make stronger connections emotionally. You can learn a lot of issues. You can learn them in school classes. Uh, you know, you can read books. You can go online. There's no uh, shortage of information, as Margot just recently implied. But building inter um, emotional connections is what's going to keep us together. And I think we recognized that in the early years of the what became the network. Um, because everybody gets a million emails, right? And the temptation is, of course, just to delete them. We're being asked to support this, give solidarity for that, pay something for the other thing. And so how are we going to choose which ones we actually can work with and pay attention to? So these emotional connections are really important. And uh, part of that is through doing things together that are more creative or more fun. Okay? There is... Um, uh a writer, an activist named um, Adrienne Marie Brown, who's an African-American uh, um, writer who's written a book called Emergent Strategies. And one of the things she talks about is how um, kind of typically um, when we in organizations and movements talk about scaling up, it means growing larger. Right? We, our movement gets larger, we bring in more people, you know, etc. And she's arguing a new way to think about scaling up, which is deepening relationships. And we know that our 22 years, um, the time that our network has um, existed, from 1997 until now, um, is because we've been able to deepen the relationships, right? And um, it's not easy, as you all know, to communicate regularly, to work together across um, not just the lines of um, uh, the structural inequalities that we talked about before, but across time and space. We were working with, I don't know, so many different time zones. Just to even get one meeting time uh, is not easy. And so what's held us together is the increasingly um, uh, deepening relationships over the years. And I think a piece of that has been getting more comfortable in frankly speaking. Frankly speaking was a term that was introduced by the women from Korea uh, some, after some different meetings. 
So that clearly there were things they really wanted to say and wanted to put on the agenda. They weren't sure how to do it. They knew this phrase, frankly speaking, in English. And that was a way of really grabbing people's attention to get, a, get us all to look at some of the difficulties about, that existed in working together. Frankly speaking, is an ongoing, lifelong process, right? But I think part of this, being able to work long term, is about developing a level of trust, even across these inequalities we talked about, and a level of honesty. And, you know, people who are involved in various short-term organizations or short-term meetings probably are familiar with the fact that, you know, people say f certain things, people sometimes have stock phrases, sometimes there's even a kind of grandstanding that happens uh, where people trot out their, you know, things they have to say in a public <coughs> context. But really being honest takes more work, it risks more in terms of whether or not the relationship can survive. Clearly, if the relationship can't survive being honest, it's not really worth very much and it won't last long term anyway. I think that's true of all relationships, not just working in political projects. But, uh, you know, so those are some of the things that we had to think more about. And I think we both came to the conclusion yesterday when we were talking this over that there's actually been a huge amount of generosity amongst the people in the network. Um, which is built up over time, so that, you know, especially people who are in dominant positions, I think one of the reasons why we avoid difficult conversations is we don't want to be seen like we're racist, we don't want to be seen as being clueless, so we try and avoid things. Um, and once we're working together, I, I must say I've experienced a lot of generosity because um, we've got to learn together and figure out how to do these things together. And the issues that face all of us, uh, you know, to work across tr uh, national lines or to li lines of wealth and resources, all these big questions that we've talked about here today, you know, need a lot of those kinds of structures and opportunities to develop those relationships. So I also want to uh, I'd like to give two examples of where um, we've been able to sort of work out some of these things. Gwen mentioned earlier in our conversation about language, uh, and we work in something like six different languages, right? Um, and so we often language interpretation and translation are seen as technical problems that need to be addressed. And we came to understand that really language is power and it's much more than just technically, you know, um, translation. Two more minutes. Okay. Uh, and so what we did was named um, interpretation and translation as political work explicitly. And then um, created spaces for the interpreters to come together and figure out the meanings of specific words from their own languages. So it wasn't just uh, translating and interpreting English concepts into every other language. But every language group, you know, um, was able to bring in some key concept related to our topic that they needed to have understood by the rest of us. And so we ended up developing a feminist activist glossary mm -hmm. with the key concepts that are uh, relevant for our work. So that's just one sort of way to mitigate some of the inequalities, and in this case, particular, particularly around the power of English. So, we have, yeah. so, and we have done stuff around ecology and, you know, all of those things. We really wanted to just focus on the, the methodological parts, um, just to have you all think about how we've really tried to manage the kinds of things that um, we described earlier. There's the document, yeah. I don't know which bit yeah. you So, um, back in 1999, uh, many of us in the network went to the Hague Appeal for Peace. It was the 100-year anniversary. And um, we, along with other feminist um, peace activists, came up with something called the Gender and Human Security Network Manifesto. We created this network and then came up with the manifesto. And um, um, the document, 
document says many of the things that have been said earlier, uh, but I want you to just share with you um, our vision of um, uh, security um, and, and the culture of peace. To live in a culture of peace, we have a code of ethics that denounces all forms of violence. We have spiritual growth and fulfillment and bodily integrity. Security is based upon respect for human life as a foundational principle of politics and economics, just and effective international laws, people-to-people -people communication, a commitment to peaceful conflict resolution, equitable distribution of resources, material and information, democratic control of uh, economic institution, and the health of the biosphere. And so, as um, Kainan talked about, these ideas about uh, ecology sustainability have been long part of the feminist movements, not just the strictly speaking eco-feminists. And in finishing, I would just like to say thank you. Thank you to Wolf UK for really uh, pulling together a marvelous seminar here with all these different pieces. I'm very excited and curious to know what's the next step with all this work and uh, you know how we can use it to move forward. Uh, and uh, thank you, Margot. Thanks, Gwen. <laughs> Let's party. Thank you, Margot and Gwen. Um, I think we are shown a really good example of working together. Um, yes. So um, I, uh, we would like to take some questions from the floor. Uh, maybe um, Rebecca. Hi. Um, so thank you very much, both of you. It's very interesting for me to see this dialogue between. You, because as Gwyn said, you know, we first met in 1982, I think it was, um, and I met Margot last year, and Gwyn, you were on that first um, Women Cross DMZ, um, and then Margot, I don't know if you were on the first one, but certainly when, when I met you, we were both on the, the one in 2018 at this kind of crucial time, and <clears throat> I then came to your meeting afterwards which was about that nexus of not just war and violence against women but specifically militarism and its abuse and violence against women through your work with the so-called i hate the name but comfort women um uh in in korea and your work for justice for them so my question for both of you is that kind of nexus on working on the so-called kind of uh again, I hate this language is itself indicative, the hard security issues like, you know, peace and, you know, denuclearizing the Korean Peninsula and, uh, you know, and the issues of violence against women, which is absolutely central and underpinning of all kinds of militarism and war, and how you work that into the different ways that you work you know, internationally and also interpersonally. Good question. question. Go ahead, have a go. Yeah, I mean, you've asked a complicated question, and I think, obviously, we're not working on the what you call the big issues, necessarily. Right? We hope that what we're doing will have an impact in those areas. Um, I became involved in, um, and they're not, the group of women I've been working with are not referred to as comfort women necessarily. Those women usually are the women who were um, uh, taken by the Japanese Imperial Army during World War II. The women who, uh, whose lives I've been concerned about are kind, is the continuities of it when the U.S. military took over Korea after the Japanese. Um, but it's women in prostitution around the U.S. bases. Right? And I became interested in that group of people because there were abandoned mixed race children who had been whose fathers had left them. Right? They were the fathers were involved with the mothers, and the children were left uh, behind. And what I've come to understand in not just that activism, but in the various kinds of activism I've been involved with, 
is really thinking about how these big questions that we're asking directly impact people, and in particular women, and how are their lives affected. Right? And some folks already talked about that, you know, indigenous women, all the other groups who are most affected. And I think it's in a, for me it's a question of background and foreground, right? Keeping in mind the intersectional analysis, you know, denuclearization, all those things, and in the in the in the foreground is really the suffering, the empowerment, uh, the the resilience word I just absolutely detest these days because it's so used uh, overused, but um, agency, you know, of the affected women. That's for me where my emphasis is. You know, we were challenged to get involved in this by women from Okinawa. And they came to the States in 1996, following on from a rape of a 12-year-old Okinawan girl by three U.S. military people. And their thought was, if only people in the States understood the impacts of U.S. bases on their communities, we would be able to change U.S. military policy. Uh, that was a very optimistic assumption on their part. But what they said to us is, you know, you're responsible for this, you're living there. And the two things they pointed out were the impacts on the environment, of uh, pollution, bombing, uh, noise, and all the rest of it, and impacts on people's health, and also, uh, you know, military violence against women. And there is a, a security treaty between the United States and Japan, the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty, and one of the things they said very clearly was, we have the U.S.-Japan Security Treaty, but it doesn't protect us. Uh, we need a different definition of security. And so that was really the basis of a lot of the work we've done. And Margo and I and other people, you know, we've written all these little articles, redefining security, colon, and then put in your subheading, uh, and spent a long time talking about this redefining security. But I first learned about this interconnection of levels of violence, including international military violence and interpersonal you know, violence, especially gender-based or sexualized violence, you know, through Greenham, actually, and through the thinking that um, was being developed as part of that movement. Yeah, and, and I learned it through my involvement uh, as one of the founding members of the Combahee River Collective, where we as black feminists talked about imperialism and uh, capitalism as, and what all of those things meant for us as black, lesbian, feminist women, right? And so the theorizing that we're doing now goes way back before our network. And so it's, uh, the continuities, I think, are really important and the ways that theories keep growing and deepening uh, with uh, the experiences that we've had over the decades. Any more questions? Uh, with regard to the African Defense uh, Command, uh, AFRICOM, that you mentioned, uh, it's basically a uh, defense force that is based in Germany, a big uh, base, I mean the command is made from the, the American bases in Germany, but there are bases everywhere, almost in Africa. And one of the problem is that it's there to secure the interests of the American through replacing any dictators. I mean, Africa at the moment, particularly places like Central Africa, where they've say they have so-called removed francophone is actually controlled by the American through militarization. So there is no uh, how can I say it uh, um, solution. All the solutions are military, and they're using this uh, African command uh, base in in Germany to control whatever is happening in Africa. They're using uh, the satellite like uh, NASA, you know, to uh, look at uh, where minerals are so that you know they're controlling the rebels group so it's the bases are there we we even have a base in in the south of congo where no congolese have access mm -hmm. and and it, ha it has been going on for over 30 years mm -hmm. there's an american base there 
uh, planes are coming with arms and then they're taking minerals and so militarizing Africa. Yes. That's what the African Command Base is. Absolutely, and we're clear that you know the main purpose of the U.S. military structure is to secure the interests of the transnational corporations, mm -hmm. right? And that the gov U.S. government officials are deeply connected to these corporations, right? So it's hand in glove kind of a relationship. And thank you for giving those examples. Okay, now um, I would like to thank Gwen yeah. and Margot, but um, I also was informed that um, today is special day for Margot. Is it actually Margot's your birthday? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the 26th, but I'm happy to report that it's my 70th. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you.